Howdy there, folks, and welcome back to the Brightworks and another game of Beyond All Reason. Today, taking a look at Tundra Continents. Let me just show you that real quick. Tundra Continents version 2.3. Very happy to have you here. This is a... Oh, that's a nice little drawing there. Let me clear the map there. Okay, now we're nice and clean, ready to get started here. <laughs> this is an interesting one. It's got a little bit of a naval choke point in the center of the map, which is really cool. If you know me, and I'm sure all of you do, I'm sure all of you watch every video, Every, uh, every live stream, all that stuff, certainly. <laughs> certainly. And in case you don't, always uh, feel free to subscribe down below. Happy to have you here at the Brightworks. You know that I love Navy. I'm a huge, huge fan of the Navy. It's one of the things that I enjoy most about this game is the interaction between the naval units in this game. I think the factions have some really cool ones, and I think it's one of the uh, more interesting matchups because of the, how quickly the dynamics can shift and how outplays feel even bigger in the seas. So a choke point on Navy is really interesting because static defense is very, very powerful on Navy. So essentially a concave of naval static defense right here or right here going to be very, very powerful and very difficult to break through. So it's important that commanders push this as aggressively as possible to make sure that they don't have to fight into a concave static defense and can set up their own as quickly as possible. Representing the blue team and spawning on the southern side here down in the oh not in the waters swap positions I guess spawning on the ground on the uh, on the land I should say the land lubber representing the blue team in cortex here going to be copper mouse copper mouse spawning his cortex and gonna be playing with bots uh, Probably not for the entire <laughs> game. I would imagine hopefully not uh, But potentially going to be going for maybe some cheeky shenanigans here and there maybe going into t2 getting t2 constructors up This is this looks like an eco position. I would say yeah yeah i would say probably an eco position here going into t2 it's probably not unlikely for uh, copper mouse's future and i wouldn't be surprised if that's what's up on the docket representing the red team all the way across the map here spawning on the northern island little island of their own it's ee -hee. Ee -hee. <laughs> adorable little laugh here going to be spawning as a uh well an air player interesting going for an air lab on the island i guess i can see where he's coming from here Going for the fighter, going for the finch, going for this, the uh, transport here. Going to try and move the commander off of the island, I imagine. Yeah, I see where this is going. So there's a problem here. There's a there's a flaw in the logic here, and it's essentially what do you do with this 840 metal worth of T1 aircraft plant that you're essentially leaving behind if you pick up your commander and get out of here? I don't know. I don't know what the answer is. <laughs> There is a scout out on the map and a uh, fighter as well. I wonder if what we're looking for right now is commanders that might be in a transport. Ihi is kind of going for a strategy of their own and assuming that other people are doing the same. Unfortunately, it does not look like that is the case whatsoever. There's a little bit of imbalance in this map now that I'm looking at it here. Yeah, there's the islands aren't exactly mirrored here. So you can see there's like these two islands right over here that just don't exist on this side. So. It's kind of a more viable strategy to go for the transport here and move the commander like that, as opposed to uh, how viable it is for this team. So that's kind of an interesting mix up here. I wonder what these stats are for this map. I wonder if anybody could leave that comment down below. What the stats are for this map, north versus south, who typically wins and who typically falls. Fighters now patrolling all over the place, and I think, yeah, they're looking for a juicy connection with the commander, but I really doubt they're going to find it here. Nobody has gone into any kind of air transports. Valley Art is the only commander with an air lab currently and has no interest in moving the commander around, using the commander to build a whole bunch of wind turbines. Now, what I'd love to see is a bomber. I think a single whir a single whirlwind bomber would be very, very powerful here. That's the Cortex T1 bomber, and they are definitely powerful enough to kill windmills if you bomb them correctly. You have to make sure that a couple of those bombs, I want to say three, it might be two, though. Yeah. Um, some of those bombs have to land let's just leave it at some of those bombs have to connect and if they don't then you're actually in a really difficult position because suddenly yeah i mean your bomber has to come all the way back around gives them time to throw up anti-air defense so learning how to bomb as a cortex bomber is definitely well worth it can i say bomber a hundred more times in this video somebody should probably put a count down below <laughs> okay yeah so you see this constructor was trying to set up the static defense but the blue team doing a great job of pushing through here they know that as soon as that static defense gets up this is a hundred times harder to break through and so i love to see that these gunboats are going to start blasting away at a lot of these dolphins trying to hold the line here very nicely done i think the aggression can't stop though we need res, res subs to come eat up all that metal lying on the ocean floor here should be a good couple hundred 600 ish more or less more and less metal here as the uh, ships come and go 
What does it feel like? Oh, there we go. <laughs> Hitting the wrong keys here. Anyways, professional commentator, Brightworks. That is a Death Cavalry. So we are getting Resurrection Submarines up and running. Is it a Death Cavalry? Yeah, it is. It's just like partially clipped into the ground, it looks like. Yeah. Oh, anyway. <laughs> Res Submarine will come out here for Fenris. And uh, I would love to see that moving up to the front. I think that's probably exactly what's going to be going on here. Gunboats are already out and the frigates are out too. Frigates are definitely decent at engaging against dolphins, but you kind of need to be careful with them, right? You have to make sure that you're engaging at the right angle and at the right opportunity. You have to make sure that if they're coming towards you, you're retreating. And if you're going towards them, you're pushing in. It's very, very tricky to navigate. And they're not as maneuverable as those dolphins are. So you have to be very, very careful with them. Okay. Eventually finishing up a T1 air constructor. Going to go for wind turbines. Um, I guess that's all well and good. I really feel like we should go for like three or four it just air constructors just immediately off, off the bat here. We do have metal extractors coming up. We have a constructor pumped out here. This constructor eating up all the rocks over here. Well, all the trees more likely and going to build a metal extractor. So that's not too bad for Ihi. Meanwhile, actually, yeah, I mean, both sides, both the uh, both the, we the, the west and the west. <laughs> Trying to say the west and the left at the same time. Anyway, the west and the east side, um, both left and right, going to be captured for the most part by the red team. Although I will say that love your mom. Uh, it's a worthwhile sentiment, by the way is going to go for a, yeah, a little bit of aggression over here with some hovercraft here. So hovercraft aggression on the uh, on the, the side of the, well, the left-hand side of both teams here. Nice little run by over here, or float by over here, hover by over here, there we go. Going to get some of those seekers through and trying to, seekers? Seekers. I always get these in the, uh, the Armada T1 naval uh, anti-airship, the skater mixed up. Sound very similar, I suppose. Uh, Hippocultor is in a lot of trouble. That's a Silver Starlight Laser Tower. Got tons and tons of damage off on that commander. Hippocultor is now going to be forced to retreat. Tail between legs, 15% left on that commander. And Super Rockside, still looking fairly solid here. A couple of medium tanks and a riot tank. Going to be more than enough to kill this commander, but they have to be microed exceptionally well. Uh, and the riot tank has no choice but to come within degunning distance if it wants to kill that commander. So it's a little bit tricky. Rocketeer is included here, and it's going to start whittling down on some of those bases. Ooh, killer D-gun right there. Takes out both of the medium tanks. And a pounder. Going to get a couple shots off. Yeah, all right, not bad. Rocketeer now whittling down the LLT. Not bad. And that's going to be Super Oxide. Basically forced out of position here on this, this uh, well, western island. I keep wanting to call this the northern and this the southern island, but it just doesn't make sense. That was like a lot of build power we were setting up over here. Definitely planning on going for some incredible static defense. <laughs> At the very least, this build power is going to be great for repairing all these ships. Because, I mean, yeah, they could dip into combat and they can just get themselves repaired back up at this sort of forward repair facility. Yeah, okay, so that's what Loki is going to be going for here. Building a forward repair facility. Interesting. I guess I don't hate it. Yeah, I, uh, I, that's, that's actually really powerful. Repairing ships is definitely viable. They cost a lot of metal, and so keeping those in the fight while you're continuing to build up your own numbers, definitely worthwhile. Diversity has managed to claim this northern sect section as well. This was held onto by Shaker for a little while, but eventually Diversity's commander was able to move forward and capture a whole lot of those metal extractors. Looks like a, a naval constructor was able to capture these ones as well. That's quite funny. Didn't expect that. Yeah, the Seekers see this. They're like, wait a second, where did these come from? How did, how did this even happen? Uh, and they will manage to go blow up a whole lot of these. There is a light laser tower over here, and that's enough to shut down a couple of these seekers. I think yeah, I think we have enough that we could probably float them on by that laser tower, but probably going to come at the cost of quite a lot of them. It's an interesting dynamic, right? The more units you have, this is true of most RTS games, but the more units you have, the more efficient the units become, uh, especially in terms of static defense, right? Like, they kill it so much faster that you take less damage, which is a uh, interesting... You could make some interesting graphs about that, right? Like the amount of damage that you take from a LLT as you push into it is like this, right? It's a curve on, on this axis. It's a curve like that, which is interesting. This, of course, is a graph that looks like this. <laughs> In other words, um, in, in non-graphical speak, these are going to be able to besiege any uh, fortified position with relative ease and comfort. 
Are those, oh, those are seaplane gunships. I thought those were T1 gunships. I actually like this quite a lot. A couple of cutlasses here gonna barrage down a whole bunch of these hovercraft. Essentially for free. I mean, technically there's that light laser tower tickling away at those gunships, but that's not really that big of a threat. And uh, Diversity's Commander now in a lot of trouble. Yeah. Let's see, taking off, what is that, about 4% per shot here? More or less 3 or 4% off of Diversity's Commander per shot from each of these cutlasses here, and that will be the Commander going down. And these seaplanes have, have poked exactly in the right location at exactly the right time and managed to break this fortified line over here. Very nicely done by those gunships. I think the riot cannons on these are some of my favorite weapons in the game. Very, very satisfying. I have a... I have a deep appreciation for them. I think they're very, very nice. That's going to loosen the grip of the blue team on the western island. Meanwhile, on the eastern island, looks like there was a commander kill over here. Yeah, looks like... Uh, b d bad b bad Yeah, B-Bad. <laughs> Buh bad, yeah. Uh, Commander did go down here, and all that metal is going to go back to Ihi, who is now pumping out a, quite a lot of vehicles, actually. Has gone for the construction turret, has gone for the construction vehicles here. More and more medium tanks to cement this. It's a tricky business, because if you build too many medium tanks, you've specced into a lot of units that you really can't use for the rest of the game once they're... You know, once they're up and up and running and they're on land, the, the naval units don't really care about your your ground-based units, your land-based units. They're more than happy to just swim on around the uh, the connection here. And you can see this is exactly what I was talking about. With these static defense lines being set up, it's very, very tricky to push in here. Now, I would like to see these destroyers starting to tickle away at these units. No reason to have these not just constantly firing away at long range. I think that would... Uh, well, yeah, I think I would like that quite a bit. Another thing that might not be a bad idea is giving a lot of these units over to one player. Like, essentially handing this entire army over to low-key. That way, when the aggression is mounted, it's every unit being used for aggression. Because it's like I said, the more units you have aggressing, the more efficient the trade is going to be. And that's no exception here, as I think... How many, how many oppressors do we have here? Four oppressors plus three corsairs. Uh, four Corsairs is going to be much more powerful in the long run than, uh, you know, four Corsairs and then five Oppressors later on down the line. Has anybody gone to T2 in the water yet? Let's see if we can spy any. Don't see... Ah, uh, there is a T2. Okay, interesting. So Super Oxide has gone for T2. Went for a little bit of a forward position here, but eventually lost it. Still managed to get that T2 up, though, and I think that's probably well worth it. Coastal Torpedo Launcher will be taken down here eventually, I do believe, and these medium tanks will also burst down all of these Dragon's Maw to pop up Flamethrower turrets. Nicely done here by the red player, easily cleaning up this position using that artillery, and then eventually the medium tanks and shutting down all of that metal. Nicely done, giving Ihi a distinct advantage here. Oh wow, Ihi going into a uh, T2 lab here. <clears throat> Interesting. I didn't see that coming, actually. I didn't think T2 was on the docket here, but I suppose there's quite a lot of metal extractors, so I can understand why you would. Nicely done by Superoxide, by the way, to hand out T2 constructors to anybody who might need them. It's usually more efficient to have one person go T2 Navy and have everybody else just buy constructors because of just how expensive those T2 constructors are. Uh, also, the T2 Naval Lab is 3,200 metal, which is vastly more expensive than all the land-based T2 labs, so... Important to remember that you always need to uh, try and try and get that teamwork running, even if you're doing something super greedy, like you have some sort of timing attack build that you're being very, very careful to uh, make the timings on. Always consider opening up your build a little bit if it means getting your teammates at T2 and you're the only one who has T2 super quickly. Especially if they're willing to pay for it. <clears throat> I've run into that problem in the past where somebody's doing a very, very tight build and they don't really have time to mess around building other people's T2. Um, but then people send units, or uh, rather they send metal to the, the person going T2 and they're caught in a weird position where it's like, well, now if I don't build it, you've essentially, uh, you, uh, essentially the person's been robbed of 500 metal. <laughs> Which is not the end of the world, but it's certainly uncomfortable and it doesn't make the uh, teamwork dynamic work out especially well. The ferret here, as well as a couple of light anti-air towers, going to start shooting down a couple of these gunships. Nice little trade right there. Some of those were stacked on top of each other. Ooh, we'll kill two for the price of one. 
fighters also coming in here. These gunships have been wasted. No value from those gunships. Well, I guess I spoke a little too soon. Did manage to kill a single metal extractor, but for what, 10 gunships or so? Definitely not the engagement that we were looking for. Those gunships certainly could have gotten a lot of value over here on this side of the map, although there are... Are there, actually? Hold on. Let me, let me fact check myself. I was going to say there's a lot of missile ships here, but I think I was looking at this side here where there's anti-air included and assuming that there would be anti-air here, but actually critical oversight on the side of the blue players where they don't actually have any anti-air included over here. Now, it's not to say that they couldn't throw some up very quickly. Tons and tons of build power here would very easily rebuild uh, or, well, build or rebuild basically anything. But yeah, no anti-air here, so actually a couple of, uh, couple of seaplane gunships, torpedo launcher gunships, yeah, not going to be too bad. Somebody did the math, and I can't remember exactly who it was and uh, where where they tested it, but they, they did some math that essentially tested the viability of seaplane gunships uh, versus each other, the torpedo gunships versus each other. And it turned out that the Armada gunship was significantly better by like a margin of almost, I think it was like almost 25% uh, or something like that. It was really, really bizarre, and I couldn't exactly tell you why, but uh, yeah, it was just a lot better for some reason. Um, something to consider if you're going for seaplanes and you plan to do a big seaplane gunship push. That, that being said, I mean, enough seaplane gunships are going to ravage basically anything uh, anywhere on the map here. Well, in the water, that is. I guess, I guess that's uh, worth a caveat. Forward hovercraft platform will be built here. That's a nice, nice little formation we've got. Queuing these units using the uh, F and then left click and drag makes them into a little box formation, which is quite nice. Very neat and organized. Always looks pretty epic. <laughs> Got the destroyer in the back too. That's really cool. Yeah, I like that command quite a lot. I think it's very powerful. I don't use it very often, but there are specific, specific times when it can come out and be uh, pretty cool looking. No damage will be done over here. There's just too much build power. Yeah, no, uh, no way, no way that this is ever going to go down. There's just too many construction turrets repairing everything constantly, which is great. That's excellent forethought here by Loki. I wouldn't have expected that. I probably wouldn't have gone for that. I would have gone for just more and more units out the gate, but uh, maybe this was the right investment here, going for enough build power to keep everything well sustained. Now, on the other hand, Super Toast has also got himself some build power, and that's keeping a lot of these units, but it is all clumped up here. So just a couple of barrages of missiles or volleys of plasma gunfire will eventually barrage down whatever build power is over there a little bit of a stall here i'm gonna actually go ahead and click two times speed because i feel like we're headed into a kind of game where there's not really not really a whole lot to do here i do like the copper mouse is going for a, a lot of energy overflow at the moment i mean that's not that's just a just a byproduct of having an advanced fusion reactor, right? But <laughs> overflowing a lot of that energy to the team, regardless, is going to be a, uh, yeah, a decent little advantage to them. Power overflowing starting, then moving to metal overflow, anti-nuke this side. So we're intentionally overflowing metal, is that is that the idea here? It's difficult to do on advanced fusion reactors because, uh, yeah, it's pretty easy to spend all your metal on advanced fusion reactors. They're quite expensive. I guess this much energy overflow is quite nice, though. Yeah, the blue team, 18,000 energy per second versus the red team's 13.2 thousand energy per second. Yeah, it's quite nice, actually. I hear aggression over here, but I don't know exactly where at. Oh, interesting. Superoxide has gone for a forward bot lab on land here. And it's pushed a whole bunch of units in. Riot tank, pretty good, though. <laughs> yeah, pretty good at shutting down a whole lot of that. Missile ships now actually actively barraging everything over here. And I think we now finally have sort of a critical enough mass to start actually doing some significant damage. This is definitely the worst case scenario for these build turrets because there's too many things to focus on. So they're constantly repairing different items, different structures, different buildings, different units, all sorts of different things. And eventually that's going to mean that they get overwhelmed here. And I think that's exactly what we're starting to see. Destroyer goes down. Eventually the static defense will fall as well. And it's only going to be a matter of time before those missile ships thoroughly bombard everything over here to smithereens. Now, there is counter bombardment over here, so that's nice. It'll only last so long. I tend to favor the team that has more missile ships firing constantly.
Time for another wave of units. Bunch of pawns roll out. They do find a Fury Wreckage. Oh, you know it'd be a good move right there was actually capturing that. I think the commander capturing that would have been a really, really slick move. Could have allowed you a very cheap, very effective way of making sure that you have some sort of very effective anti-air over here on uh, the little base that you have as Super Oxide. I think that might have been the move that I would like to see going for. Pawns here firing their guns into the water. <laughs> Not the most effective unit and you know, naval naval combat, but uh, certainly not the not the worst thing in the world. I'd rather have them than not. Looks like that uh, missile ship aggression has been retaliated upon, and this is a huge engagement through the middle of the map, middle of the map by the blue team. I'm gonna go ahead and switch out of 2x speed here as we get into 1x, and that's a lot of gunships. Holy. 41 seaplane gunships right there. Fighters move to intercept immediately. These gunships are, uh, well, being killed. <laughs> They're gonna get to shoot a little bit before they die, but I really think fighters should have been included in here. Those gunships are swept away by all of these fighters super, super quickly, and that will be all she wrote for that many gunships. That was a massive investment for not a whole lot of return. I'm not sure about that one. I'm not sure how I, how I feel about that one. I'm curious about what Copper Mouse's strategy is here. Going for a whole lot of eco and just planning to overflow it, I suppose. Going for another fusion reactor. We are now up to four and encroaching on five. We have currently eight energy converters. Taking down 5,000 energy per second. So well overflowing energy. I mean, tons and tons of energy overflow. Does that work? I mean, I guess it works, right? You're, you're overflowing that energy and your teammates can, of course, use that energy to build uh, units or metal or whatever they need the energy for. So yeah, I mean, I guess I'm looking at the uh, the bars over here on the right-hand side for the blue team and yeah, a lot of them are tending to uh, tending to be full. <laughs> no, uh, no leakage at the very least for, for most of these players. A lot of them not actually able to spend all the metal that they've been given, or the energy that they've been given, rather. I think eventually this facility over here is going to fall. Medium tanks continue to push in here. Looks like the commander was killed, yeah. Super Oxide's commander going down does kind of remove any significant threat that was available over here, and I think it will not be long before that forward bot lab will collapse. Meanwhile, massive engagement over here as a bunch of, uh, a bunch of those torpedo sniffers do manage to, uh, well, they find all the... These are the torpedo sniffers, by the way. Uh, these are the to torpedo haulers, torpedo throwers, torpedo slingers. That sounds kind of cool. <laughs> submarines, in other words, if you're a normal human being and you like to call things by their normal name, submarines firing away. However, uh, yeah, enough depth charge launchers, enough static defense, enough of everything to recuperate here. Actually, that's a lot of aggression that didn't really manage to push all too far. Held fairly well here by the red team, and this is where all of the difference is going to be written. Res sub starts to eat up immediately, but I really think we need more than one. I think we need about 10. Looks like there's more on the way, so I really do appreciate that. You can see when I hover over this here, 4.1, no, sorry, 41,000, make it 45-ish, uh, constantly growing. Thousand metal pooled up in this massive, massive reclaim field here. Those red subs are about to fund the entire, yeah, the entire red team. One of the red players did tap out here. Oh. Looks like it was a disconnect, actually. A little bit of a pause, and they are back. A capital ship was produced by Super Oxide. Interesting. That was not the move that I saw. Capital ships are very expensive, so I'm a little bit surprised to see that so aggressively. But I guess it is going to allow you to besiege this area, and it's not like this is very condensed. You kind of would have to beshield a huge portion of land here. I mean, you'd have to put several shields across this area, and then you'd have to shield all across here as well. It's just a very inconvenient to place to hold from a capital ship. So actually, very hesitant to say this, but a capital ship might have been the right idea here. A lot of, uh, a lot of fire over in this direction. Looks like some medium tanks trying to break the lines, but not going to fare all too well against these pincers, the amphibious armada tank. Heavy laser tower is also doing a great job of bursting down quite a lot of them, and eventually eventually this will be held as well the red team essentially repelling all of the attacks and then bouncing back with whatever aggression they can muster and i think that's exactly what you're looking for here in these naval fights oftentimes the one who can win the first fight typically ends up winning the game and at this point with so much metal being overflowed by pindakas 
Yeah, I think eventually this is a tremendous advantage for the red team. Despite the economic support coming out of this backline player here for Copper Mouse, I, uh, which I, I like. It's rare that we see support done very well. It's very difficult to do very well, which is why it's so rare that we see it. But uh, the the this, despite that, despite a pure eco player, I think more eco is done reclaiming off of the front lines than ever is uh, done in the back line, right? Like you can scale eventually, but to, to have economy that scales quicker than reclaim, you're essentially gonna need that, you know, multi multi layers of advanced fusion reactors and energy converters to several hundred, if not thousands of metal per second kind of, uh, kind of economy. Torpedo planes trying to drop their bombs here on whatever they can. I think the res subs would probably be a valid target. However, yeah, these submarines on the front are actually very valid too. Krakens are extremely expensive, 1,900 metal per Kraken. They fire a very damaging, very long range attack here. But I'd love to see more than anything else though is actually just a sonar. Just building one of those long range extended sonars with the T2 constructor. I think I'd like to see that quite a bit. I can show you what I'm talking about here. This bad boy. You can see the blue line there is the sonar radius, and it would actually allow you to see really, really far out there. It allowed these uh, res subs to, or rather these uh, assault subs to get a decent trade. Capital ship has now torn apart all of this base here and is going to continue tearing apart anything that it can. It does have a radar on it, so I believe it can, yeah, it has a radar so it can see out into the distance, try and fire it, whatever it can see out there. But radar does not really give you much advanced intelligence, so sometimes it can fire at sort of dumb things, like for instance, a single grunt running around. <laughs> is it the most complex thing? No, but uh, is it effective? It's shutting down the firepower here from this capital ship? Yeah, I'd say it probably is. Bomber's now dropping their payload on top of this vehicle bay, really, really frustrated about dealing with this player, and they say, get out of my lane. Eventually, the vehicle bay will go down here, but already a bot lab is up and running. So res bots, I mean, they will do their nasty work and get that back up and running in no time, I'm sure. Starting up the hovercraft span. It's a uh, it's a tried and true. It's a great way of getting vision where otherwise there is none. It's not very cost effective, not nearly as cost effective as bot spam, but certainly better than nothing. A couple of archangels get caught over here, actually. That's actually a lot of archangels. Hold up, how much metal is in that wreckage field right there? Well, okay, that's a bit more than I was expecting to look at, but uh, yeah, 7.8 thousand metal in that massive wreckage field right there. Uh, do I have a, is there a constructor nearby? Gunships pushing in here. Anti-airships are included though, and as well, those fighters can also be pulled. Uh, I think eventually that's going to clean itself right up. I feel like the noises are super loud again. That was about right there. Oh, the audio issues. A constant, constant pain of mine. Wow, that's a lot of bombers that got shot down right there. Dam busters are very good against clusters of uh, units on the water. Their, bounce, their bombs bounce, which is quite odd. Um, but yeah, it means that you can drop them on the water and they will bounce to their target, which is pretty funny, but also pretty effective. And I have to imagine it's designed off of that bouncing bomb, the, the bomb that was designed to be dropped out of a plane rolling towards a dam that would bounce off the water into its target. <laughs> it's quite the, uh, quite the intricate explosive. We'll throw the bomb at them so fast that it bounces on the water and kills them. Sir, yes, sir. I mean, this is not an economy to be scoffed at, certainly. Ten advanced fusion reactors pumping out a grand total of 30,000 energy per second. It's a lot of energy per second, and yeah, I mean, the blue team is making good use of it. I don't know. I'm, I'm curious to see what you guys think about an economy support player. I think, I think it's difficult to justify in a lot of scenarios, but this might be one of the few where it works pretty well. <clears throat> Just because of the fact that more people contributing units to the center here is not exactly going to be a... It's not, it's not the... It's not going to define who wins here. Typically, it's going to be whoever can manage to build up the right units at the right time and strike strategically here, using siege units properly, making sure to constantly being applying pressure I mean, you know just a whole lot of strategic decisions so I guess on a map like this I really don't mind it 
eventually, I mean, 154 metal per second being used on building these advanced fusion reactors means that eventually, yeah, we're going to see a bit of an overflow. I think that was the idea here, was eventually metal would be overflowed from this economy as well. Yep, yeah, another fusion reactor starting up here. Interesting. Hovercraft leaking through on this northern right-hand side. Those are hover tanks. I thought those were, those were the uh, Seekers, but they were actually hover tanks. Those energy inverters are looking ripe. Yep, I think it's time we pop those. I, yep, there we go. Okay. A little concerned we weren't going to, but we do eventually pop the energy converters, and that disables a large part of the economy here for Super Toast. It's like same exact thing happened over here from a hover tank, managed to pop a whole bunch of energy converters. All said and done, yeah, I think this is a pretty pretty great engagement right now i think that uh yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna guess that our green player is probably pretty happy about that my audio just got out what on earth just happened i am getting all sorts of audio weird feedback <laughs> i sure hope that's not a uh a too prevalent distraction for you i hope that's just on my end that i'm hearing that and it's not uh breaking up i know i've had audio fragmenting in the past i, I thought i fixed that problem as well and it just ended up reoccurring so i'm not sure exactly where that's coming from i hope it's not my microphone or something like that because otherwise i'd be a little distraught about it another massive engagement here but there are a ton of submarines lurking under the water so these despot are not actually as effective as you might hope Look at this crowd of res submarines just miles and miles of infinite res submarines 30 grim reapers 45 death cavalry um, all of them working their very best is to put together or reclaim or resurrect or whatever they need to do all of these ships here. At this point, you might as well just start eating up the enemy ships that are sitting right on top of you. Serpents also included here, and they're going to start firing away. Those, uh, those heavy missiles they launch are extremely effective against the, the likes of a Black Hydra here. Shredding off a couple percent per hit, which, I mean, for a capital ship is very, very substantial. The amount of units leaking through on this side is concerning, though, and I think the yellow player has recognized that. Positioning a Dreadnought in the way, as well as a couple of these Paladin, trying desperately to stunt the effect of these units leaking through, but already a ton of them have broken through. T2 Lab even goes down here for Super Toast. Yeah, this is not looking good. Dreadnought actually having a really hard time hitting these units because they're so quick. Hovercraft, uh, hover tanks specifically going to be rerouted in such a way that they collide with the base, the newly rebuilt base of Ihi. And, uh, well, there is a shield generator, so that's nice, I suppose. Yeah, you gotta get right on top of it, and eventually you'll be able to kind of self-destruct all of them. Okay. It's a interesting way of doing that, but I, I suppose it works eventually. Efficient? I wouldn't say that. Effective? I wouldn't say that either. <laughs> but, uh, possible? I guess you could say that. Holy serpents. That is a lot of those bad boys. Lurking under the seas. They are, whoa, that was not exactly what I was looking for. Somehow I managed to get to the very back of the map. Yeah, these serpents are quite good. Weird. I wonder why it does that. <laughs> That's a little bit annoying. Sorry about the jumpiness there. Either way, the static defense line for the red team has been broken, and that's essentially all she wrote. Once that, once your static defense line and this choke point is broken, the units are going to stream through the middle like it's nobody's business. They're also going to eat up all this metal. 59,000 metal. I mean, this, uh, this reclaim field has just continued to grow, right? Like, there hasn't been a point in this game where... Uh, the reclaim field wasn't massive, and now with the right-hand side falling as well here, you can see the anti-air under siege. Construction vehicle is going to go down here too. Very shortly, I do believe. And that is going to be all she wrote for the red player's forward facilities as well. Did keep the air lab over here, so, you know, managed to, uh, managed to stay in the game in that direction, but I think at this point there's just not enough. Yeah. The blue team now lingering on 2,000 metal. The red team only 1.3. 700 metal difference is definitely significant. And uh, yeah, I'd like to think that Copper Mouse did a great job of contributing towards his team with a whole bunch of metal. That's uh, or a whole bunch of energy production, rather. Using the energy converters to consume as much of this energy as necessary, but not too much. It's a tricky balancing game, right? Between constructing 
the right things and letting your metal overflow. I have to move that bar in and out here. Timbo says, D-Bad, I left you a little message. <laughs> message was. Cataphracts rolling out. I have a particular love for the cataphract and it is a thinly veiled mask that it's just my nostalgia for uh, Clone Wars animation and the way that the uh, the hover tanks looked in that that animation series. That was uh, always always reminds me of that. Those, uh, those, those long snozzles mounted on top of the hover tank. Definitely very, very reminiscent of the uh, Trade Federation heavy battle tank, or main battle tank. I don't know all the terminology exactly. Not my precise expertise. I just know they look cool, and I like the lasers that come out the front of them. Man, these serpents are powerful. Serpents, in many ways, are just like sharpshooters. They're the sharpshooter of the seas. <laughs> In the same way that the uh, the bat is the chicken of the cave, the serpent is the uh, the chicken of the seas. Very very powerful. Or the bat the the serpent is the sharpshooter of the seas, I should say. And when you have this many of them in number, like I said again about that efficiency thing, you have enough units, they just get more and more efficient because of course they can one hit more and more units as they start to group up. I mean, at this point, Serpent's terrorizing the entire map here. I love that we're splitting up more and more waves of them, though. What does the purple production facility look like? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Serpent's flowing out at a ridiculous rate right now. All of this funded, might I add, by the reclaim from all of these submarines here. 100,000 reclaims? Sure, why not? More reclaim than ever before. And, uh, yeah, these, these red subs are essentially funding this ginormous amount of sub of uh well serpent production submarine serpent production i don't mind it though i think it's definitely very nice i uh i will take a look at the end of this game at the overflowed resources from copper mouse i'm very curious how well the uh the overflow went here curious if it was significant or if it uh is going to look like the amount of overflow that a regular tech player does <laughs> You know, one of the players that doesn't exactly know how to tech, but really, really has a passion for it. Certainly always appreciable. Shiva are now coming through the water, and they're going to start besieging anything that they can. A lot of their rockets hitting on this dreadnought right now. Well, hitting this dreadnought, I guess not hitting on the dreadnought. Yeah, you know what? I was a little skeptical that the Shiva were going to be able to really get anything done, but all those units were parked pretty close, and I think at the end of the day, it is the end of the day. And those Shiva did manage to do it. Now, there are some naval landmines. We don't see those very often, but they're quite powerful. They certainly pack a punch. Yeah, I mean, Shiva are probably a pretty good target for them. I believe they're a heavy landmine. Heavy sea mine, I guess? Yeah, heavy mine naval series. Torpedo gunships are out. The uh, Monsoon. It's very powerful, but uh, I, I feel like it might be a little too late here. Bunch of cutlasses flying forwards. Wow. So yeah, that's a lot of gunships running forward right now. Flying forward right now. Where are they headed? These gunships are going to try and take out the economy here of Argusel. And uh, I think they're going to do it. Yeah, there goes the energy converters. The, the fusion reactor, please. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, this is tragic. What on earth? What are we doing, boys? That might be the saddest... Yeah, the saddest gunship micro I've ever seen in my life. What an absolute tragedy. Anyways... Averting our eyes from that business. 
no, I get it. It's it's an APM thing, right? Like there were so many gunships flying around. I'm sure they were busy microing them all over the place. Just what a bummer, because that definitely could have been a, a, a decisive blow here to Argusel. Anyways, torpedo bombers are going to start working their magic on a lot of these ships over here. Capital ships starting to fall all over the place. Whoops, sorry about that. Bumped my microphone. Just finally got back into a gym routine. And uh, for anybody who, who is familiar with it, getting back into a gym routine after not being on your regular gym routine, you got to go for that like week of pain where just everything hurts. <laughs> it's not the regular soreness that feels kind of nice. It's the, it's the pain, but it's good means uh, pain means growth and growth is always good that is the bright works way seekers here are actually getting ravaged pretty nicely by these hover tanks which were resurrected of all things um i don't mind that that's actually quite nice a little bit odd uh we don't it's just an interaction that we don't see very often but yeah i mean those uh those do fall to the bottom of the ocean when they're killed and you might as well resurrect them right if you need some sort of a land-based force and you don't really have one it's a decent option here Dreadnought actually getting a really nice hit against these. A lot of the tanks manage to run by, though, and eventually do take down that T2 lab. But once again, got to be frustrating to play as this player because that lab has just gone down so many times. However, with this amount of res subs, shouldn't be too much trouble to get it back up and running, but certainly just very annoying. Not your, uh, not your happiest moment, certainly. We're not stopping, though, with tons and tons of crocodiles as well as the Seekers pushing forward. T1 submarines actually do pretty well. They trade out fairly well against these serpents. The serpents, of course, one hit these submarines, but they also tend to overfire. Friendly fire. Not not friendly fire, sorry. They tend to uh, overkill a lot of these units. And so sometimes you can get away with producing 100 submarines and 50 of them die, but the remaining 50 manage to kill the advanced submarines so so much quicker than the, uh, than the advanced submarines can recharge their shots that you just start to trade a little bit more efficiently over time. Shiva eventually pushed through. Oh, the landmines aren't detonating. Interesting. Uh, hmm. Could have swore that those detonated on units underwater, but I suppose not. Torpedo launcher is going to have a field day firing away at the Shiva, but the cataphract, of course, are the perfect counter to those as they uh, hover across the water surface, and so there is no way for a torpedo to target them. Oh, never mind. Cataphract had a change of heart and are instead going to head towards this direction. Shiva finally popping up out of the water and going to blast away all of those torpedo launchers. Curses upon thee for, uh, yeah, causing so much havoc. Bunch of these cataphracts in the back line as well. Harassing Timbo, whose commander is actually in a lot of trouble here. Yeah, commander actually in a lot of trouble here. Does go down. And these cataphracts essentially have free reign over a massive field right here. Whoa. Watching that number go down. Quite, quite potent. <laughs> Eventually, the T2 facility will go down as well. Yeah, those cataphracts, they mean business. And that is the backline, or at least one of the backline players for the red team now collapsed. The blue team just hasn't been able to get any damage done to the... Uh, or Sorry, the red team hasn't been able to do very much damage to the blue team's backline. And so I think eventually it's just going to be an outscaling game where now the economy is already almost more than doubled here for the blue team uh, in comparison to the red. Man, these serpents hit hard. It's not every day you get to play with hundreds and hundreds of serpents. <laughs> Certainly a treat just because of how powerful they are. And you can see these T1 units just melting away under the serpent fire. Again, they tend, to, they tend to overkill, though, which is their main flaw. You really have to spread them out a lot. Even then, because of just how huge their range is, you're not really guaranteed an efficient hit against anything. You can see all of them firing in this direction. The only reason it was a little bit efficient is just because of the fact that they were all firing in a uh, kind of a direction towards other enemies. So the... The overkill eventually just pierced through and hit everything behind it. <laughs> okay. Two capital ships, apparently enough to deal with a bunch of cataphracts. Not to say that the cataphracts aren't doing some damage back, though. As you can see, one of these capital ships is bursted to pieces. 19% health left on that bad boy and 64% on its best cousin. They're not looking all too good. 
Suddenly, the lines are broken. All hell is broke loose. Do I dare check how much metal is laying around over here? Oh, just a casual 136-ish thousand. 47-ish thousand. <laughs> it is an infinite metal source right here. Essentially, you can constantly reclaim in the center of the map, and you're never really going to run out of reclaim potential. So it makes a whole lot of sense to have this many res subs just constantly eating up metal. 56,000 metal in the bank here for the purple player. And that number is growing, too. Copper Mouse now up to 91,000 production and only 7,000 consumption. Interesting. Balanced out right around 300, and, or 300 uh, metal production per second, which seems to be about what they spend on upgrading fusion reactors or building more fusion reactors. So I wonder if there's a, wonder if there's a method to that madness. I would sure love to know. This replay was submitted on the Brightworks Discord channel, by the way, in case you would be interested in sending in games of your own. You're always more than welcome to do that, do that over there. I, uh, I will have a link to the Discord, as I always do, down below in the description in case you'd like to join up and become a member of the Brightworks. Um, which, I mean, if you're watching this, you already are. Welcome aboard. But uh, that's where that's where I'm officially accepting replays anymore. I do have an email server. I, uh, it's uh, brightworksreplays at gmail.com. Might as well type it. Brightworksreplays at gmail.com. And if you're interested in sending replays, you can always send them on over there. I don't check that nearly as often anymore. I'm much more active on the Discord. Uh, but, you know, if you don't have Discord or you don't feel like downloading it, you're always more than welcome to uh, send the replay on over there, and there's a, there's a chance I might get an get a opportunity to look at it. Oh, those fusion reactors, chain reacting was beautiful. It looks like there just wasn't even there at anything at all, <laughs> uh, except for the wreckage of a single fusion reactor, I suppose. A dragon for good measure. Sure, why not? Might as well. At this point, there's so much metal out on the field that it doesn't really matter. And uh, yeah, that is going to be the torpedo bombers taking out all of the economies underwater for all of these different players. This is a uh, this is a done and dusted game. This is kind of cool. Ihi has managed to uh, hold the line here, so to speak. <laughs> Managed to hold on with bulwarks and scorpions and flak turrets and everything. Essentially just not worth committing the energy to kill all this. And so it's just a whole lot better to go around. And that's exactly what the blue team is doing here. Uh, not, not as uh, satisfying a chain reaction there. I was really hoping for a big satisfying explosion, but I guess not. Underwater explosion's not nearly as pretty as the... Uh, the advanced fusion reactor explosions. But yeah, this is game. I mean, the Serpents have gotten to the back line. The red team no longer has anybody with any tremendous economies, and now they're slowly falling further and further behind under the weight of the infinite res sub horde. <laughs> Their duty is to resurrect, yet they must eat. Dragon will be blown out of the sky by enough flak turrets to shoot down an army of, of uh, aerial units here. Hover tanks are pretty good, actually. The laser hover tanks. I like them quite a lot. They're a pretty powerful unit. Hee <laughs> hee says, ah well, should have played C as usual. And I'm not exactly sure how I feel about that. On one hand, it was really neat to see the interesting build order as far as uh, moving the commander over there. But on the other hand, I really don't think it was the optimal move to go for air yourself. I think I think if he, he had to just bought a air transport from another player or just received one, usually those are free. But, uh, you know, either way, managed to negotiate for themselves <laughs> a uh, aerial transport. I think it probably would have worked out a whole lot better because they wouldn't have had so much metal tied up in an air lab on their back their back court. I think really committing to fully on going into the aggression over here might have worked out a little bit better. But even then, it's difficult to say because there's so many different players that you're going to have to fight over here. There's so many angles to hold on to. And at the end of the day, those capital ships are perfect for sieging land base positions. So you'd have to have such an advantage. It would be almost, almost, I mean, it would be very, very impressive to get up to an advantage where you'd be able to hold on to the, uh, the shoreline there. The amount of shield batteries, the amount of artillery pieces, the amount of everything that you would need is just staggering. Anyways, the last commander will go down here for the red team, and the blue team will capture victory against all odds here. Let's take a look really quickly at uh, the stats here. Interesting. 
Copper Mouse, not with the most impressive economy. That goes to low-key. However, uh, most of this economy for low-key actually comes back from reclaiming. So, I mean, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of metal all came back from the res subs that were just eating away whatever they could. So, uh, despite not the most impressive economy, definitely pulled out the most metal per second. What I do want to see here is the statistics chart. If we go to Copper Mouse and we look at the uh, energy metal excess... Oh, I guess not excess, but the energy excess, maybe? Maybe not. Maybe this is the wrong... Maybe this is the wrong thing to look at here. Anyways, uh, as far as metal produced goes, 493,000, almost a half a million. Definitely very, very nice. I, uh, I have a feeling that a lot of that was going back to the team here, so I guess I don't really mind it. 90 million energy produced as well. A lot of that went back to the team, so uh, very nicely done. I don't think this shows the overflow, but I would really love to see it. Anyways, thanks a ton for watching. I sure hope you enjoyed. If you enjoyed, you can always show me that by leaving a like down below or leaving a comment. I love hearing from you guys. It gives me a little serotonin boost every single time, a little dopamine boost, I mean. Uh, but anyways, this has been the Brightworks, and I hope you have a... Wonderful, wonderful rest of your day.